Hello everyone and welcome back to the Lead Green Associate tutorial series to help prepare you for your Lead Green Associate exam. This chapter is going to focus on location and transportation where we want to reduce one of the greatest impacts to greenhouse gas emissions which is transportation. We want to reduce the costs, pollution, and depletion of resources related to transportation and a lot of this starts with picking the correct location. Now according to the EPA over the last several years, Transportation contributes to give or take 30% of greenhouse gas emissions. So we want to select a location that enhances the environment and reduces transport. We want to protect sensitive sites from harmful development. We'll also be discussing brownfields, location density, transportation, land protection, and the categories are divided into location, transportation, site development, and health slash livability. Now, it's true that many projects do not get to pick the location, but they can mitigate the impacts of it. For new buildings, of course, you want to locate it in the correct area if you have to build a new building. There's really a focus on using existing buildings first, so even if you can't select the ideal site, you can use these strategies to mitigate the impacts. So let's see what this checklist looks like. We're going to talk about all these below in this video, but First, I just want to point out that lead for neighborhood development location, if this credit is fulfilled, that's it for the category. You do not have to do anything else if you meet these lead neighborhood credits. So let's talk about some of the location strategies. Transportation to and from the building is the largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, so you want to select a location to reduce travel as much as possible. If it's located within a lead certified neighborhood, that's certainly a plus. Locate within proximity of diverse and multiple use areas. So think about areas that are already industrial. Think about strip malls, shopping malls, things of that nature, multiple use so that people don't have to drive to another location. If they're working somewhere or if they're shopping somewhere, uh, they could just walk to a bank or a restaurant and it really cuts down on travel emissions. You wanna have the entrance located within half a mile of walking distance to other places. So let's say you can't get that shopping mall, but there's an abandoned place down the street. Well, you can use that instead. Redevelop that. Now, when we talk about site density and talking about making the best use of our spacing, we have different ways of measuring this. We have residential spaces, non-residential spaces, or combined residential and non-residential. So think about one of those stores where it's a store, but then people live above it. For residential areas, we measure density using dwelling units per acre. For non-residential areas, we use a floor area ratio to measure density, and for combined residential and non-residential, uh, we measure density with square feet per acre. Now down to transportation down here in these points. You want to reduce the number of people traveling in a car alone because that is the most unsustainable method of transportation. So we want to increase carpooling, use more efficient travel methods, increase mass transit, have more occupants per, per vehicle, use alternative fuel sources. It sounds counterintuitive, but we want to limit the available parking to encourage carpooling and, and public transit. So to do that, we're going to provide only the minimum number of spots required by the building codes, and also have pooled parking where two or more buildings share the same lot. Now, when we measure total parking capacity, we're including only the new and existing spaces, new and existing garages, off-street parking outside of the project boundary that's used by employees, but we do not include fleet vehicles from the, from the building, we don't include motorbike or bicycle spaces, and we don't include on-street spaces. We want to develop in areas with multimodal transportation, where there's a lot of different transportation op options available. And for this, we want to locate the entrance at least a quarter of a mile, or at most a quarter of a mile from a transit stop, or half a mile of certain other transit stops. We're also going to designate 5% of spaces for green vehicles and 5% of spaces for carpooling. This could be preferred parking right past the handicap spots, and that's certainly a good incentive. Now, green vehicles must score at least a 45 on the ACE Annual Vehicle Rating Guide. Now, that's ACE AC 3Es. It stands for the American Council for an Efficient Energy Economy, or actually, American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. Then, we want to install electric vehicle supply equipment in 2% of spaces. Also, liquid or gas refilling or battery switching stations in 2% of spaces. 
for cars with clean diesel, neat ethanol, or compressed natural gas, uh, more cleaner than their counterparts. Now let's head to the site development. Now the second largest impact other than transportation is the building itself. So we want to protect the land, human life, and wildlife from building impacts. It's really important that we redevelop existing sites rather than build on new sites. Think about all the abandoned buildings that you've seen or all the abandoned buildings that there are. Rather than building on new land, we can redevelop old sites. And that's a key category, that's a key concept of LEED. We want to preserve green fields. Green fields are previously unused suburban or rural land, so we want to preserve those as much as possible. So we want to encourage redevelopment and get away from the high costs and damage of taking up more open space. We want to avoid sensitive land, so we don't want to develop on farms, floodplains, threatened or endangered habitats, water bodies, or wetlands. Using previously developed lands is also great because the infrastructure is already in place. You don't need to expand into open spaces, you don't need to add more plumbing or electricity, it's already there for you. Now, this also may sound counterintuitive, but you want to develop on high-priority sites, such as brownfields. Now, a brownfield is typically an undesirable, empty, and sometimes contaminated site that no one else would want. So work on redeveloping that, because a lead project can come in and help remediate that land. And that is a great strategy, because why just have that land there decaying and becoming more of a problem? It's got to be cleaned up. So that's one of the goals that lead is trying to accomplish. Other areas, other examples include the EPA's National Priority Sites, Federal Empowerment Zone Sites, the Department of uh, Housing and Urban Development's Qualified Census Tract. There's also the Historic Infill District, where a building must look like the local architecture. Superfund Sites, we've probably heard that term before. This program investigates and cleans up sites in a federal program on the EPA's National Priority List. Federal empowerment zones are highly distressed urban and rural areas that receive uh, federal aid. CDFI fund, this promotes low-income community development. And then we have HUDs, the Department of Housing and Urban Development's Qualified Census Tract, which are uh, units eligible for housing subsidies and tax credits. So these are all very helpful areas to develop on. Let's go to health and livability and finish here. So there is this concept called stakeholders versus shareholders. Now shareholders are usually the people who are financially invested in a project or a building. Uh, they're the ones who are concerned with the economic bottom line and usually only the economic bottom line. Now that's not what LEED is about. LEED is more about stakeholder inclusion and stakeholder considerations. And stakeholders are everyone who comes into contact with the building or everybody who is affected by it. So think about the employees, all the outside uh, contractors, especially the surrounding residences and the community. So these are very important to consider, stakeholder inclusion. For people using the building, we want to increase physical fitness by promoting walking and cycling. And high density areas are great for this because it requires having walking access to other basic needs so people don't have to keep getting in their cars and going to different places. For people who are bicycling, provide bicycle storage, bike networks and infrastructure, as well as showers. Use a shortest path analysis. Now this is assessing how far one would have to walk or bicycle to a destination. Provide bicycle maps and bicycle maintenance assistance because if someone's bike breaks down, they can't get home and you know, accidents happen. So you wanna have that in place. Provide pedestrian amenities such as shading, benches, water fountains, trash cans, bike racks, you want to encourage neighborhood connectivity, so don't have cul-de-sacs, no gated communities. Use a street grid pattern, it encourages walking around, getting around easier. And of course, create a diverse community, become inclusive of the needs of the community. And finally, promote access to sustainable food and grocery stores. Uh, this, is, this is really about inclusion and, and basically it draws logic from the lead neighborhoods. And this is really one category that you're going to find repeated a lot, especially in sustainable sites, especially in energy and atmosphere. And this is great because you can see how all of this comes together in LEED. You can see how all of this comes together. It's the same knowledge, uh, basically repeated over and over in different ways. And you can see how, 
how beneficial this is to everything, such as when we talk about sustainable sites, uh, things such as having limited parking, underground parking is great for reducing the heat island effect. So it's really important also to recognize this checklist and see how this is different from sustainable sites. Sustainable sites um, are, are much different from location and transportation. So keep going through your checklist, keep going through your sample exams and the content. Best of luck to you, and I'll see you later. Thank you.